become a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash golden era bookworm for hard to find books scans of rare photos and articles on the golden era of bodybuilding hi everybody golden era bookworm here today i'd like to go through your physique august the august issue of 1951 with clarence ross on the cover what a glorious cover for Clarence Ross at his peak, really, at least at his muscular bulk peak. Um, he was known as the king of bodybuilders back then. Won the Mr. America in 1945. And since that time, just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, yeah, he also won the Mr. USA professional beating, I believe, Steve Reeves. Uh, back in, I believe it was uh, in uh, 1948 or 1949, I forget the exact date. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a fantastic cover of Clarence Ross. Now, one of the best articles, I have to admit, from this particular magazine has to be the article which I featured rather recently on Food for the Champions. Basically, it describes these Silver Era diets and I was asked so many times to talk about this that um, it was, to be honest, to, to talk about the Silver Era diet is a very difficult thing. And I think it's very hard for a lot of people to understand. But back during the Silver Era, just zoom out a tiny bit, there was very, very few details and information on diet because understand that supplements actually and, and the whole thing about diets really especially the high protein diet which we are all accustomed to today only became a big thing during the early 1950s when Irvin Johnson namely Rear H Blair started to advocate the high protein diet and the use of animal proteins for bodybuilders and um, it was really after men like that as well as Arm and Tanny who was known to follow a raw food diet and actually he consumed a lot of raw red meat um, although he did not admit to it until later on because it was rather radical and to be honest the high protein diet that silver era bodybuilders used to follow especially high in animal proteins uh, and some going to the extremes of having raw food like arm and tanny it was just way too extreme for the general populace firstly Silver era diets tended to be very, very much whole natural food diets. And I have covered this in a separate video, but just quickly looking, you know, here at this article, if I zoom in on it, and I have already explained this, as I've mentioned, but you can see that the types of foods that are explained, you know, they're just natural foods. We're talking for, for bulking up, for example, which is a very high calorie diet. Um, to bulk up what was, uh, you know, as it says here for bulking up, increasing your strength and, and power and, and your weight, you basically just ate a very moderate carb, high protein, moderate fat diet. Whereas if you wanted to cut up, and this guy's, I mean, diced, look at that, upper body, absolutely shredded. This, it was basically a high protein diet, much higher protein diet. One could almost say, um, that it was very low in carbohydrates, very high protein and moderate fats. That's what was recommended in the silver era. From here, of course, Vince Gironda, Rio H. Blair, all of these guys started getting their ideas from, because understand that these gurus, so to speak, emerged from the silver era, emerged from learning from the, you know, legends such as Armand Tanny, who was well known in Muscle Beach, for example. And others. I mean, I've, I've spoken to even to Rick Drayson, where in the past, where he rests in peace, when we had our conversations, how he used to basically, you know, talk to the guys at Muscle Beach. He'd watch them eating, you know, cream or yogurt with with protein, and that's how it all started. It wasn't a big thing back then, and and this is a very hard thing for a lot of people to to understand. When I talk about Reg Park, Steve Reeves. People want to know their macros. <laughs> you can't answer that because these guys basically had an intuitive diet. They followed a very whole natural diet. They didn't calculate things like they did nowadays. All I can tell you is that they had a fairly moderate carb, moderate fat, high protein diet for bulking up. 
and they would reduce the carbohydrates, still keeping the proteins up and the, and the fats at a moderate level for getting cut. And as I said, from that stemmed the teachings of Vince Gironda and Rio H. Blair. So this is a very, very interesting article. Again, I talked about this recently in a video, and yeah, there's no need to really go through more of that. But I thought I'd tell you some of those stories because I do find that interesting, that really it's those pioneers like Rio H. Blair and Vince Gironda they actually learned from these silver era bodybuilders, much like Rick Drayson told me uh, when we talked about it, that mainly people just kept experimenting and finding out what worked. And that's how this all started. So there's no macros, no calculations back then, as frustrating as that may be to many of you, especially from the younger generation that wants everything calculated and in a table format to make it so easy to follow. It was not that simple back then. Anyway. Going through the magazine, uh, there's always an editorial from Joe Guida. It's always about, you know, body, why bodybuilding is awesome, which it is. Here we have um, the Junior Mr. America contest, as well as the weightlifting champions, which I will pass. But we have some great photos here of a very young George Payne and Marvin Eder. Here we have Marvin Eder taking third absolutely massive i mean this guy was absolutely massive and we have george payne who actually won the contest look at that thigh development man this guy was pretty pretty uh, impressive of course he, he was he's, he's a real silver era legend and he was featured um for many many years i believe that he actually served to be the idol the initial idol of larry scott uh, there's a story how Larry is looking through the trash um, and finds some, you know, weeder mags with George Payne describing how he trains for his triceps. And of course, that started off Larry's obsession with training arms. Very nice uh, report there on the Judy Mr. America contest. Uh, Here is a very, very interesting article on Alvin Lee, who I believe was the first Asian at least uh, a bodybuilder with an Asian background that was ever featured in a Weida magazine. I mean, he's, he's not huge at all, but very, very aesthetic. I definitely believe this guy's natural. Uh, yeah, very, very nice physique. Nothing over the top. Looks very athletic and very aesthetic. Very nice. Um, if anybody knows more about Alvin Lee, let me know. I could talk about him. I mean, he's... His exercises and, and program are given here. But yeah, if, if you do want to find out more, I'm happy to do a video on Alvin Lee. He did compete quite a bit, and I've seen more photos of him as he, as he progressed. Then we have some other interesting articles here from Abe Goldberg on forearm development, how he uses the Zotman curl and all sorts of cable curling mo mo uh, motions, really, as well as the gooseneck. Uh, wrist curl, the reverse wrist curl, and a very interesting yeah, lying down. He's lying down here with his arms pronated, but facing, of course, the ceiling and performing wrist curls like that in a very isolated fashion. Some very, very unique exercises shown here on forearm development. Interesting. Maybe I'll do a video on that. Uh, then we've got an interesting articles there from uh, Clarence Ross and now from I believe this is Charles A. Smith on developing the lower back. Now <clears throat> I wasn't going to really talk about this too much but all I can say is that the lower back development is something that a lot of people don't really think too much about in the gym. Mainly a lot of people will do you know at most deadlifts and hyper extensions but I'll tell you who was a massive advocate of strengthening the lower back. That's Reg Park. Reg Park really believed that this was one of the secrets to developing strength. And anyone that has ever done very heavy squats, especially high repetition, um, heavy squatting, for example, the 20 rep squat, will soon realize that your lower back starts screaming anywhere between the 10th to 20th rep. Uh, it's not necessarily your thighs that are screaming, but if your lower back gives man you are going to be in a hell of a lot of pain and in reg park's five by five routine uh, which is his, i believe three different phases he has you constantly training your lower back to strengthen it because 
your shoulders, you know, being supported by your rib cage, clavicles, etc., scapula, your arms, everything, right? Uh, that's a, a very strong frame for, for example, a barbell to sit across when you're squatting. Your thighs are naturally, the, your legs are the largest muscles in your whole body. What's in the middle? The middle is your trunk. Your trunk is composed of your abdominals and, you know, your obliques and transverse abdominis and as, as well as your erector spina at the back. And so if the trunk isn't strong, it's not going to be able to really support the weight that you need to for long periods of time. For example, when doing the 20 rep squat or when doing extreme um, programs like the 20 rep deadlift or the 20 rep clean. And, uh, I mean, these are these are very old school silver era techniques for gaining massive size. And uh, yeah, I mean, the silver era bodybuilders really focused on developing the lower back, not necessarily as a getting muscularity out of them, but getting it really, really strong. Um, that was a, a major, major part of their success. I mean, understand a lot of these guys did Olympic weightlifting. Most of them did Olympic weightlifting. So they had very, very strong lower backs. If you guys want me to talk about lower back exercises, I will be happy to do a video on that. Here's a, a great report of, I believe, this might be the Mr. Universe competition that Reg Park won in this particular photo. I forget what that particular... Oh, no, that's Mr. Europe. Sorry, that's a Mr. Europe competition. Reg Park winning Mr. Europe. And uh, he talks about cheating exercises. This is a very interesting article. It's, from what I understand, Vince Gironda's very, very first ever feature and article in a Weeder magazine, or in any magazine for that matter, uh, Vince Gironda's very famous Train But Don't Strain article. And he talks a lot about his own philosophy of training. Really, Vince Gironda starts off with this very first article. Um, and yeah, it, it kind of is very historic because it's the first time I've ever come across a Vince Gironda article. This one's from 1951. Uh, yeah, pretty awesome. Basically, if you do want to know what it's saying, uh, or at least what Vince's message here is, is that he doesn't believe in cheating. And it's interesting because the previous article was just talking about cheating, and that was Reg Park's article. And also the one after, with Marvin Eder, um, also talks about cheating. So I personally believe that performing cheating exercises, not the whole set, but for example, just like Marvin Eder and Reg Park advocated early on in the training, to perform cheating in the last two or three reps is necessary to break through plateaus. Whereas Vince Gironda was not a big fan of that. He was also, he was always a, 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 an advocate of strict form. All I can say is that when you compare Marvin Ida and Reg Park's physique to that of Vince Gironda, you can see that there is a complete difference in the way that they looked. Marvin Ida and Reg Park had this Herculean look thick, full, round muscles, maybe not ripped to shreds like Vince Gironda got to, but that's got to do with diet. Vince had a more uh, physique that resembled the Apollo type, whereas these guys definitely had that Vulcan Herculean look, right? So does cheating work? In my opinion, absolutely. It's the only way to really gain, you know, massive size. And, uh, you know, as they say, the proof is in the pudding. Just look at Reg Park's physique and Marvin Eaters, two of the greatest natural um, physiques of all time, right? So, continuing. I think that's it. I'm pretty sure that's it. Oh, no. This is an article I definitely want to talk about. I think I may have or may have not done that yet. But it is basic power equipment for uh, lifting, for increasing your lifts. And there is... A very, very interesting piece of equipment here called the Harvey Maxim bar. Uh, and also these chain, these uh, it basically uses this, um, this chain that attaches to weights at the bottom. I don't know if any of you have actually heard about it, but it was used back in the Silver Era, uh, especially for squats, for deadlifts, and for pressing to break through plateaus. I will do a video actually on the Harvey Maxim bar. I think it's a very, very underrated piece of equipment, pretty much a lost as well through time. Um, it's It's got a different feeling to training in the power rack, 
basically you use a restricted range of motion having the bar elevated the chains are attached to weights and you just move the bar for a limited range of motion with the weights hanging off the chains it's not like today where they use chains no the weight actually hangs off the chain uh, and basically it allows you to break through plateaus it's, it's a very awesome piece of equipment rarely seen nowadays um, but I would like to talk about that especially this particular article which talks about all these other methods of breaking through plateaus that were used in the silver era very very rare um, information really mostly people use the power rack nowadays to break through plateaus as well as high boxes as shown here but there are other pieces of equipment that are simply not used anymore and that's why i think this article is just bloody brilliant i mean this article is followed by several articles after that that tell you how to use these pieces of equipment that you just don't see nowadays and are not that difficult to fashion yourself in your own, in your own home you basically just for example here just attach chains to the to the uh, bar you know and then your weights at the end so pretty awesome stuff from the silver era stuff that i had never heard of before but when i checked on the internet there is one or two articles on it but not much and especially no programs so i really want to talk about this stuff i think it's it's really awesome stuff to be honest anyway that's it i think the rest of the article the rest of the magazine is just as you can see ads and stuff but yeah it was a very very interesting magazine uh with some very rare information there as i said um you know stuff like silver era diets why cheating uh you know in your last few reps helps you break through plateaus and of course these rare pieces of silver era equipment which i want to talk about so a uh, very interesting magazine of course from the silver era joe weeders your physique august 1951 if you've enjoyed this look at this magazine give the video a thumbs up subscribe if you haven't to the golden era bookworm and yeah leave me your comments thanks for watching if you'd like to support the channel there's many ways please if you'd like donate via paypal become a patron visit my respective websites for merchandise old school uh, bodybuilding out of print books that are now available as ebooks as well and yeah hope you enjoyed the video this is the golden era book where i'm saying bye for now to support your favorite YouTube channel, please visit teespring.com slash stores slash golden era bookworm for merchandise, including t-shirts, hoodies, face masks, phone cases, and much, much more. Once again, at teespring.com slash stores slash golden era bookworm. To take full advantage of my collaboration with Old School Labs, please visit their website and choose from their marvelous range of supplements using my code bookworm12. And for an entertaining look at the history of bodybuilding's supplement industry, I would highly recommend watching Subs the Movie, which I have collaborated in, available at Amazon Prime and Vimeo.